I hope you enjoyed the uh, first day of Domain Fest 2012. A uh, quick show of hands, who went to bed before midnight? Who went to bed after midnight? Who has not gone to bed? Mm, I bet Jan Barta, where is Jan? No. Um, this morning we want to welcome Bill Hunt, uh, the top thought leader on global search engine marketing. Press, industry analysts, and corporate leaders frequently seek Bill's advice to effectively leverage enterprise and global search marketing and social media strategy. He's also an author and columnist. Previously, he was the CEO of two of the largest global search marketing firms, Global Strategies and Outrider, both of which were acquired by WPP. Welcome, Bill. The question I always get after that introduction is there a third, so I'm actually working on it. Uh, they told me when they acquired the last one that that, that, that wouldn't happen, but uh, I'm gonna do my best to, to make it so. So when I was asked to speak here, I tried to figure out, you know, what is somebody from search and talking about this, this idea of keyword modeling beyond keyword research gonna say to, you know, a bunch of domainers that in, a few of you I know do this extremely well. Uh, and that's where some of you in merchandising these domains actually make your money. Um, but, but one of the things that I found at breakfast, those of you at breakfast, there was these, these domain certificates um, on the table. And, and this was one that was there for treatment for arthritis. And what was interesting is a lot of the things that went into this valuation um, were things like searches, um, cost per click, um, value, relevance, things like that. Those are all things that we want to look at in terms of keywords. Um, and those are things that I want to talk about this morning. And, and what I'll try to do is have as many examples I can about where we can actually do that in terms of, of this process. Um, all right, so, so basically for those that, that don't know about keyword research, um, I'm going to give you in five slides sort of the oversimplified basics. Um, the first thing is, you know, you're going to brainstorm it. You're going to figure out what the words are. So whether you're acquiring domains, you're trying to do this for monetizing a site or whatever, you need to ask yourself a variety of questions. And I think that this is the same type of question you might ask if you're going through and trying to, you know, find domains to buy. You know, what is it people want? Um, you know, make a list of the products, services, and categories. Um, these are all things that you do. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about those. Um, you know, when you search, what do you look for? And we see that people go out and they use keyword tools and they bring back all kinds of words and they go out and start buying things. But I think we can start looking at this a little more methodically. And again, that first step is generating the list of words, getting related terms, getting demand, because demand's gonna tell us whether or not there's people are actually searching for it. Um, we might put things like the cost per click, other types of pieces like that in there. Uh, maybe we'll make some some comments around what phase of the buy cycle is. Where are they thinking in terms of the words? Um, the other are comments. And then lastly, which I don't see enough people doing, is what page do we want to show up? So if you're buying domains and you're parking it and you want the domain, obviously it's the domain itself. Uh, but if you're building content deeper and you're trying to actually monetize those pages, this idea of a preferred landing page is something we should look at. And I'll show you some examples. Oops, sorry. All right, so we all know, again, this is a, a quick way to do it. Drop it into Google, and Google will spit out what your site or your page is about. It gives us a nice list of words. Um, oftentimes, we'll take this and go out and try to buy as many permutations of those domains as we can. The other one we can do is we can go in, we can simply put in the phrase and get all the variations. This is how everybody does it. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to start thinking a little bit differently. First, we want to prioritize these. You have limited resources, so you have to buy the ones. And I heard people talking about this last night at the party about premium domains. That's the thing. That's where all the money is. And so as you start to move down, the same thing you should treat your keywords. All right, so that's the basics. So if anybody didn't know about keyword research, that's essentially how most people think about it. Um, what I want to talk about now is the next generation, this idea of keyword modeling. And what keyword modeling is, is really trying to understand um, the needs, the wants, um, the intent of the searcher. And I think this is exactly 
what domainers need to think like. You know, you go out and say, people want this. And again, just like this domain certificate shows, there's this many people searching for it. Um, what was interesting for this one, treatment for arthritis, people are willing to pay $5.30 every time someone clicks on a phrase related to treatment for diabetes. That's a lot of money. So if you're creating content uh, for that, we want to understand what the, the content, the intent is. They clearly want to know about treatment. But it allows you to understand the voice of the consumer. And so I think as we're moving out of this, and one of the things that I heard yesterday is domain parking is sort of losing some of its value, that we want to merchandise these domains. And we need to start thinking, like the idea of using crowdsource to create content. Someone mentioned having like 7,000 different domains related to Lasix eye surgery. You know, what are those? They're probably the different permutations of how people search and the content. But are we effectively intersecting people to that, that idea. Identifying products and services. This is another big one. Big companies are really starting to use search now to find products, niche products, you know, variations of their products. Um, and lastly, you know, social media has become pretty crazy. So just like you're out there looking at domains to buy, the same process can be used to find influencers. And we'll talk about some ways to look at this idea of authority going forward. So some of the models I'll talk about very quickly are missed opportunity matrix. Um, this is essentially finding the gap between search volume and how much traffic you get. Critical keyword performance. So you know everybody strives to rank number one or rank on the first page of Google. But what happens when you do? Are you getting your right share? And we'll look at ways to look at that. Needle in a haystack. What is the phrase that really is going to help you really monetize your content? Co-optimization, just quick show of hands, those that are doing paid search and organic search, how many people have combined that data and done any analysis on it? So this is probably, there's three or four, probably the most I've seen, even at search conferences. This is something most people aren't doing. And I'll show you some examples of how effective that can be. Preferred landing page monitoring, is the right page ranking? High ranking and underperforming. Again, this word is already ranking. You've achieved that, but you're not getting your share of clicks. Searcher intent modeling, end of life product opportunity. I suspect there's probably a few people here that are chasing things like you know, batteries, uh, you know, uh, plugs, adapters, things like that, sort of OEM type equipment. I'll show you an example where a big company started looking at this um, and, and, and made a significant amount of money. Rank performance monitoring. You know, we, there hasn't been a study, there's been one study um, in probably eight years about w if we rank at a particular position, what is our click rate? You know, Optify just came out with a study recently um, that says that if you rank in this position, you probably are getting this click rate. But what is your click rate? How much of this are you getting? And lastly, this keyword cluster and authority. I think this fits perfectly into this idea for domainers that ha we've bought a bunch of domains around a topic. What is our authority on that topic? So just really quickly, just, you know, I know it's early and it was a great party with an open bar, so you know, either half of you probably say he's full of shit, we already know this, so let's get into the meat. But here's some things that these were companies very much like yourselves that I think missed a lot of opportunities. So this large electronics retailer, and end of life products, for those of you who've been in sort of like a Dell or an HP, they, when they no longer sell it, it's called end of life. It's done, marketing has nothing more to do with it. But people still use them. If we look at the computers in the room, some of them might be one year, two years, three years old, if you need a battery or something like that. So we looked at the words. We simply went out into Wikipedia, grabbed all of the product names for this one company, and created pages in paid search, uh, for each model because they didn't have time to create web content. They had $400,000 in incremental revenue in 90 days just by targeting products that they weren't targeting to begin with. These are their, they have these, somebody else sells them. eBay sells them, some affiliate sells them, but this company wasn't. This is low hanging fruit. These are the kind of things that many domainers will buy, domains around models and types, but we just don't take it to the next step. A UK travel site, matching keywords to top ranked pages. So basically they were ranking for words like one was Easter holiday deals, but another page was ranking. So they had a great click rate, rank number one, great click rate, which is the two things we want, but no sales. It turned out it was last year's deal page and not this year's deal page. Simply did a redirect and fixed it, 
and sold $120,000 worth of travel in 25 days. Because it was around a specific holiday, once that holiday is over, they can no longer get that revenue back. It's done. So little things like this, when you start matching up the right page. National Instruments, it was a great article about a year ago in the Wall Street Journal on how they had identified four or five new USB products simply because people uh, looking at keywords and seeing what people were searching for related to USB. So very similar to how we go out and find domains. IBM and Siemens actually now use keyword research to, to name products. Are there too many competing products? So um, they were gonna, IBM was gonna come out with a database tool. Uh, the code name was Viper. They looked and there was people, all kinds of things, Viper motorcycles, Viper alarm systems, Viper this, Viper that, and they decided to name it something else. So we can find this, and I'll show you where we can look at social media you know, to mine data there equally well to find opportunities. And I think for domainers, you know, social media data may even be a better place to start finding opportunities for, for domains that may not be, be out there yet. All right, last one, this, this e-commerce site, they mapped paid and organic. Um, and if we look at the first one here, we see that it's their brand name. In paid search, they were making, I think it's, what, $2 million a month, uh, spending about $200,000. But in organic search, they were making 79 million. So why are we buying our brand name in paid search? Yes, it's strategic, but, but let's just look at the data. So that one, we could probably argue we need to do it, but what about some of these others where we're spending a premium or we're spending five, $6,000 on a word um, and we don't even rank for it organically? So if that's a word that's important to you, you know, check to make sure that you're actually ranking for it in organic search. So in this case, when they looked at this, they actually not only increased revenue by 250K in SEO by ranking for words, they also saved about $100,000 a month in paid search by shifting money away from words where they were converting higher in organic. So this idea of understanding searchers, and again, I keep coming back to this, this is the most fundamental part of search, but even in the search industry, we forget these things. You know, what is the intent and why are people searching? And so, you know, very simply, if we step back and say, there's three types of searches. These informational, so people wanting digital marketing conferences. Two, navigational, they, they want to find the Domain Fest agenda. So how many people Googled that phrase to find it? You know what the site is, but how many people actually looked online for the agenda? Just a couple? Okay, so there's a few of us, so we go out and search for that. So people that put on a conference, we want to make sure that we connect people with that. And lastly, transaction, I want to register. And I find this is always a challenge that I actually want to buy. And, and when I tell you I want to buy and I'm using a buy word, too many times we're not connecting with people in terms of what they want to do. And this is huge. You can do, those of you that are online, do a search for like a specific model of a digital camera. And, and all these paid ads and sites will come up for the largest selection of digital cameras. I just told you I wanted a Canon S60 digital camera. I don't care that you're the largest selection, connect with me in the intent that I asked for. And so, you know, this idea of purchase cycle and intent, so they're re are they researching the product? Are they looking for information? What is it that they're trying to do? Are they looking for features and functions? It's very interesting, if you look at YouTube on mobile phones, one of the biggest things people go to YouTube for is to listen to how the speakerphone works on YouTube. There is no handset maker, not Apple, you know, not any of these guys, none of them actually let you understand how the speakerphone works. And so how many of you have been in your hotel room, need to do a conference call, forgot your headset, and you use the speakerphone? Well, there's people that have time on their hands that go into YouTube and actually do a video of how that speakerphone works. You know, so what are the features and functions that people want to know about? Comparing brands, if they're comparing A to B. Um, those type of things. The same thing, I, I love domainers that, that buy a misspelling and then all it is is a simple link to the actual site. You know, I know a couple of companies that, that their five biggest affiliates just do that. You know, but that's the intent, they want the real thing, they don't want some fake. So when you load it up with all their alternatives, you end up losing out as opposed to driving them forward. Looking for discounts, those of you that have merchandise sites or e-commerce sites, Look to see how many people are looking for your discount code, especially if on your checkout page you have that stupid box. 
How many people have done that? You went to buy something, and you see that little box that says discount code. What do you do? You immediately go and Google, where's the discount code? Can I save 10 bucks, or can I save 10%? I haven't found any merchandisers yet that have really tried to take advantage of that, even if you put your own. Why can't you rank for your own website's um, discount code? At least you can track how many people use it. So little things like this, when you understand what people are trying to do. Have they already purchased? Is there a signal in their keywords that tell you that? This is a chart I created at, 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 for a large handset maker who at, at, about eight years ago wanted to get their mobile search product out there. Um, outside of porn, what do you think is the number one thing people search for with their mobile phone? Restaurants, well it's pizza. So this mobile phone maker wanted to rank for the word pizza. Because if people search for pizza on a mobile phone, then they must want an application to search for pizza on a mobile phone. It's faulty logic. And so we built this chart just to say, first off, there's only three of your phones that allow this kind of search. So let's start with that. And sort of trying to understand who are these people, and this is just this using things from traditional marketing to make the connection to what people want. Understanding keyword qualifiers. Again, I think this is where we have an application back to domains, is you know, have people use something that told us what they want. And, and uh, this is pretty interesting. So upper arm shaper, they actually want to shape that part of their body. Cloud computing deployment strategy. So if you're IBM or you're Rackspace, you, know, you want to have something that specifically answers that question. Underwater photography mask. Um, this is one of my pet peeves. That's what I do in my spare time is I, I under, I'm into underwater photography and I have a great blog for it. Um, I try to monetize that. So I write things being a search person to specifically get the clicks. So here's this idea of mix match. So anybody, I know it's early, but anybody want to say, tell me what that is? Is it a girdle? Oh, it's a mannequin, yes, but the object on the mannequin. <laughs> All right, we got a hostile audience already this morning. Um, shapewear, shaping underwear, shaping intimate. So here's what's happening. You know, these, these uh, um, fashion companies, you know, they all come out of New York, and so they use lofty terms. Like, they would all call this shapewear. And what's interesting, if you actually do a search for girdle or girdles, um, there's no major manufacturer out there for that because they refuse to call it a girdle. Some will even say it's not your mother's girdle. Um, and so what we found is, look at this interesting data. Girdles is number one in terms of query volume. It's got the least competition, and competition for those that don't know paid search is how many people are bidding against that word. So this is one of these things where it is opposite of what should happen. It's the most popular word, typically it's the most competitive. And look at the cost per click, it's the lowest. And so they're missing out on huge audiences, and while in New York they might call it you know, shapewear or shaping intimates. The rest of the world actually calls it a girdle. Um, and so things like this, we need to think about what people outside of our industry actually think and call it. And we can find huge, huge opportunities when we have this disconnect. This is an example of what I was talking about. This is a blog page. I wrote this, and, and every time I present on search, I show the current example. So I did this search yesterday um, for um, underwater photography mask. And there's about 2,000 searches a month. And this is a page that's been so finely tuned for that phrase, it's amazing. Um, but look at the ads that come up next to it. You know, it's not that my page was bad, but the ads are crap. You know, people specifically are looking for a mask. Here's a page about a mask, but I got Malibu divers, I've got digital compact cameras, Aqualung scuba gear. Nobody's talking about the mask. Now imagine if there was a mask, uh, an ad here for a mask. Wouldn't people probably click on that? So I'm not upset that I created content, but I'm upset that advertisers aren't writing ads that match the content I create. And as you start to crowdsource content to monetize these domains, you know, we need to start making sure that we're connecting. You know, this is what demand media does. They start on the ad side and say, hey, this is what people are willing to pay per click. Let me make sure that I have content for it. So that ties directly into this idea of keyword research and content mapping. And so the typical process, like we said, we simply throw a bunch of words into Google uh, or Trillion or Word Tracker or any one of these keyword research tools. It, it pukes out a bunch of words and we either go buy domains or we go buy ads. And it's, we call it a day. 
Um, but if we start to segment these words, what do the words mean? Can we deduce anything from the word? Again, the idea of LASIK eye surgery. You know, what are the things people want to know? And, and we did that with this shapewear site. We, we cataloged all these words into different categories. And what was interesting is from that came this chart. And it might be hard to see in the back, but the big green area was simply the category where someone explicitly put the phrase shapewear plus some type of clothing type, meaning they wanted a shapewear pants, shapewear underwear, even shapewear thong. I didn't know it was possible, um, but, but it is. And, 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 and so you know, those are the kind of things is that when this site owner saw this, they were blown away because that's not how they were talking. That's not how they were creating content. And so from this, they started retweaking their paid search messages, retweaking their social media, and reprioritize their content and actually change the way that they were going to market with products by simply looking at these clusters. This is a pivot table, same keyword worksheet that we always get. All we added to it was we just pulled out of the air categories, nothing fancy, and then pivoted it, put it into a graph. And, and what came out of this was exactly this. We now have verticals. We took that pie chart and put it into verticals and created a taxonomy. Now they're out there creating content that matches this. Now if you're a domainer and you're going after this shapewear category, which is a very fast growing category, because most Americans are like me, they're fat and out of shape and we want to look good, so we suck it all in, um, this is growing. And so taking this tells me that there's probably you know, 40 to 50 different domains out there that are possible. But from a merchant perspective, or if I'm merchandising this, this tells me exactly what content I need to create. It tells me the order to create it because of the keyword volume. So giving this to some crowdsourcing company to create content for you can be extremely valuable and extremely powerful. From there, basically they said, wow, we need to rethink this because when they want shapewear, that category word, we really don't know what they want. But what we found very quickly with this analysis was, it was either by garment type. Remember, 77% of the searches were relate shapewear plus a particular type of clothing. Then by occasion, so they want it for bridal. They want it after a baby. They want it for a date, uh, whatever they want it. Um, and then body type, what people do, petite or they'll do plus size. These guys had nothing plus size. They had sizes that fit plus size, uh, but they never called it out. And it was hard for the person to find it. And so it, it, they rethought the experience. How do we move people through these different patterns? How do we create this content? And if you're creating content at scale, uh, again, using crowdsourcing or any of your, the dynamic techniques for creating content, think through this logic. And all of this maps back to query volume. And this is what they ended up with, is they created a landing page for shapewear because we didn't know what they wanted. And very quickly, we could tag each of these destinations and, and very quickly, again, validated that about 80% of the people wanted to solve a tricky spot. Again, it ties back to clothing part. Um, and so this, this one thing right here resulted almost a doubling in the first month of revenue for this site, all because now they were creating content in the very context that people wanted uh, to know. So this new generation of keyword research and modeling forces us to, to really think that, to map to searcher actions. What do we want them to do? How do we want people to think and how do we want them to act? And so, you know, this is a chart. I did this chart probably about six years ago um, for a, um, a healthcare site. They had five PhDs in there doing medical taxonomy and they created this site and they wanted to know why they weren't converting. And so I had to have something that a CEO could understand. So I created a colorful chart and, and, and said, look, here's, the, here's your business problem. You know, you're trying to attract people, and they had three ways that they made money. Number one was uh, page views. Number two was um, around um, registration, because then they could send people offers and, and news. And third was membership. So if you had diabetes or you had arthritis and you signed up, you would be on the list to get treatment. You could manage all kinds of things. So that's how they were planning to make money. What was interesting is when we looked at how they spent money, 98% of their budget was in this informational category. Well, of course, that's what we've been taught in search. We look at the number of searches. 69% of all the searches were informational. Most of it was on the phrase diabetes. What we found is people searching on the phrase diabetes 
rarely clicked more than two or three pages. What we then realized is that 98% or 100% of their revenue actually tied back to one of those three things. And very little of their money was trickling down into those words. So we flipped the budget. Let's own 100% of the words that are in the context. So this example right here, I, I, I didn't give these guys name, but I'm pimping their product pretty heavily. Treatmentforarthritis.com, that domain fits right into the treatment area, which is the bridge between registration and membership. That site could potentially be a great feeder for the number one way that these guys expected to make money. You know, when we have things like page views and ad impressions, that's a cop out because our real business model doesn't work. And we take that, that's sort of the bonus. And often it feeds our company until our business model is validated and people actually want the service. So something simple like this, again, this was in Excel um, with a uh, visualization tool that just shows how we're mix matching against what we're trying to do. So what we did with them was simply, again, take those things across the top. Um, it's hard to see, I think we might have a pointer here somewhere. But basically across the top row, it has all those ways that they merchandise the, the site. Um, and we mapped up, do we have words? Is there demand? Is there something that we can use to try to find out what pages that we need? And then essentially that created those pages and tried to make those intersections by where we made money. And again, this idea of maximizing the modeling around searcher intent. Now searcher intent models is exactly that. If I'm looking for treatment for arthritis or treatment for diabetes, I want a treatment. I don't want you know, something else. And so I think that's a big problem is we miss out on that. And it allows us to really understand what they're thinking and why. So why did they do that query and what do they want? So if you're trying to merchandise a site you know, and attract traffic, whether you're trying to sell it or sell something on the site, you know, the better you can match that, the more page views you get, the more action that you get with that. And then how do the searcher's needs align to the business goals? Especially if you're a bigger company, the mix match in this is pretty high. We want to call it this. Just like that shapewear site, we won't call it girdles because it's not a girdle. Ours is better than that. Um, you know, so that's the type of thing. It's, it's a mix match between the two. So when we, how do we leverage this intent when we understand why did they make that query? You know, we can do it for intent modeling for paid search. You know, we can, it's a great way to increase your click rates. This is what Google's trying to force with quality score, which the guys after this session will talk about. A leverage data to inform keyword selection at a brand level. So how do we do this? You know, who gets it? Like at Dell, there's probably eight business units that all want laptop computer. Who gets it? Is it large enterprise? Is it small business? Is it consumer? Uh, who gets that word? Um, looking for identify content development. This is, I think, where it's coming next is what kind of content do we need and what do people expect? And lastly, I talked about this earlier, new product identification or changing a product. You know, we're starting to see now that people are crowdsourcing data in social media to see if we should have a blue one or a red one or a green one. And so we can use search data for the same thing. Again, here's another example, SAT test prep. So this was a site, these guys had a number of sites out there trying to target SAT test prep. Same thing, this is, their, their sites pretty much replicated um, the words on the left. This is what we had. We had these different sites doing different things, all pimping the same thing, SAT test prep. Same model, we put it in the same simple chart, and what it showed us is that 71% of all the searches related to SAT um, actually were non-test prep related. What time is the test? What day is the test? Where do I take the test? And so these guys were spending a lot of money in paid search on phrases where, and they didn't have a good match type to where they were filtering those out. But they were chasing phrases that had no relevance to the content. And so if they shift the content, sure, why not have a site that tells people all the test locations? And by the way, you know, here's some test prep materials. They, they were missing the idea of the intent. And again, 71% of all the searches related to SAT had nothing to do with what they do. And this was, this was earth shattering. I mean, they were devastated when they heard this because they realized they had wasted so much time spinning out sites and doing things that were never gonna convert. And now they had proof to rethink their model. Here's one, DuPont. We don't think of DuPont as doing anything particularly sexy, but we did some research at DuPont and found that 80,000 searches a month started with the phrase how to 
related to countertops. So they make Corian countertops. So clearly, they also make products that allow you to clean, uh, to maintain, to, to, you know, to uh, refurbish. And anything with a how-to in front of it begs for a video. 80,000 people a month were begging for a video. So they created videos and gave them to their retailers. Mining this data helped us see that people wanted content in a different format. Um, Tide. Tide, how many people have ever been to this stain removal site? None of you? This site's won all kinds of awards a few years back. Um, clearly, it's visited probably by a lot of guys, because if you look at the words that are on there, like lipstick removal, things like that. Um, but every, no matter where you come to it, the, the result is the same, you use Tide. But the way that they created this site and the way that they built the content and figured out what to put on it, they simply used Trillion's keyword tool and, and said, oh, okay, here's how many people. 100,000 searches a month have some name plus stain removal in them. 100,000 different ones. So all those could potentially be a separate domain. They've wrapped it up into one, and a lot of those are channeling into them. Again, there's people out there trying to do this, but these guys have used this data to figure out what is the hierarchical order to create this content. Category authority. So let's take that stain removal idea. So if there's a thousand different stains, how much of that is tide gathering? How much do they have exposure for? And I think this is the biggest missed area in search. And I think if there's anybody that can understand this concept is this group, because you guys buy large clusters of relevant domains. And so here's a simple, simple one. Um, Purina. They identified 1,700 keywords related to their product set, which is essentially pet food. Dog food, cat food, you know, ferret food, all that type of stuff. And so 1,700 words that they said are their clusters. And out of those 1,700, we can see here that they only had first page representation for 170, 10%. 90% of the words related to their keyword universe they had no exposure for. So let's say you're a domainer that has all 1,700 of those domains. My question is, how much first page exposure do your sites have? Are you getting 10%, 5%? And it's a very simple test. You just get a ranking report for all 1,700, drop it into a database, and then parse it and see. What's interesting, out of 1,700 words, the number one site that has the most so 1,700 words, 1,700 rank reports. We got the top 10 out of each one. Cats.about.com had the most at 426. So no one has, is in authority, if you will, on the, the, the topic of pets. Um, and so that's a huge opportunity for anyone that looks, wants to look beyond the obvious dog food or cat food. Petco, 276. They sell everything on that list. And they were only there 276 times. All right, so that's a simple little chart. What about if we take it one step further and take the words related to air, flights? Let's say you're a travel site. So in this case, we see that there's 2,400 words in that category. 4.7 million searches a month. This site only got 43,000 or less than 1% of a category that they are representing. And if you take it further, that category drove 30, 370 to almost $380,000 in revenue, and they only had 344 words ranking. So it might be too early for all those numbers, but the net was uh, they have less than 1% of the traffic because only 14% of the words in that category are on the first page of Google. So what if they could increase that? And we could see some of the other examples where they have a higher one. So, the air price value. These are people looking for cheap discount flights. And so in that case, they have 72% of their pages uh, on the first page of Google, um, but they're still only getting less than 1% of the traffic. That means their pages, their snippet sucks. We got the ranking, but we're not getting the click rate. So these two things allow us to see very quickly without any kind of bullshit whether or not we own a category. And if you're thinking of owning a category with domains and content and sites, this simple test allows you to see that very quickly. So the value, identify targets for inclusion in press releases. So these are people you want to reach out to. I bet if, if I have a pet site, I want to target cats.about.com. They're there most of the time. Potential link partners. This is the big thing if you're trying to monetize content. These are guys to go after for links. 
Social media sites, including blogs and forums, this is what we're starting to see. We're starting to see bloggers overtake brands in some of these categories because the brands don't care, they just spew out whatever they want, but a blogger is targeting that very richly. And lastly, you, know, you can target your keyword landscape, so you can really understand what are the words people are using. And so mining for opportunities. Um, you know, this is that missed opportunity matrix I talked about. Um, this is one that I did for a, a computer company. Um, it's 20 words, and basically we said if we could increase traffic by 3.75%, just get 5%, it means 95% of the people that want a laptop, and we sell laptops, they don't want it from us. But just 5%, what we were able to find is that we would be able to save, save $220,000 on page search clicks just by getting those clicks from organic and not from paid. So it's a slightly different way of saying, hey, we suck, but, and we're paying a lot of money in paid search because we don't do well. And so very, very powerful tool for you to see where's the big gap. Underperforming keywords. This is a, a list of words where you're ranking one, two, or three, but getting less than a 5% click rate. Again, a very simple chart to produce. Now, what, I can't even see the numbers, but, um, we're saying on one of these words that if we could get just 2.4% more traffic, um, that would be $77,000 in revenue based on our current conversion rates. So it's a very, very powerful tool to figure out where you're missing out on opportunities. End of life, this is that example I mentioned. So simply listed these products. We listed about, I think it was like 400, uh, 500 different products here. Um, just targeting those, just you know, getting it would drive an additional almost 50,000 visits a month. And when they did that, I already gave you the, the numbers, but, but this 48,000 visits actually generated $400,000 in new revenue. This was just lying there to be picked up. All right, so this searcher interest keyword modeling, this is a fancy way of saying how we got that number for Purina. We went out to all the different you know, pet sites and grabbed their words and looked at their data. Uh, similar to what you do if you have a portfolio of sites. We collected it all just like everybody else does. We put it into these clusters, that's what was different. And we started finding things that 58% of the searches were dog related. That surprised us. We thought that people would be searching more for cats, but dogs. Here's really the big one. 50% um, were looking for general information. You know, just random things about it. But the big one that, the, that these guys thought was amazing was 66% of the words related to pet food were dogs. Now, I don't know if you've seen any cat commercial. Cats are finicky. They eat off a server platter or a crystal plate. What do dogs do? They're always pouring the dog food. It goes all over the floor. The dog eats off the floor. So why do we care what we feed our dogs? But that's what they thought. That was the message, because that's how people think about it. You dump the 50-pound bag of dog food, and they eat it however they eat it. But they found that this is crazy. This is not how people search. And so this kind of data allowed them to radically change the way that they were marketing and thinking about the marketplace. It allowed them to understand nuances based on dogs and cats. And by the way, nobody searches for pet food. Well, some people do. But most people, it's dog food or cat food. And more specifically, it's breed specific. Again, that opens itself up to domains. Aligning social media. So this is the big thing. This is, you know, we see people all trying to figure out how to use social media. And very quickly, add those important words to your social media monitoring. I asked about 20 different people that, that manage social media. I said, have you ever talked to your search team and got the words that they're, you know, breaking rocks every day to try to rank for? Like, no, we haven't. Where'd you get the words? I don't know. These are just words we thought of that we should test. That's crazy. Test these words. Test the words that you're optimizing. Understand the sentiment, the context. You know, what are people doing? And here's some interesting things. So we did this test around about a bunch of different holidays or vacation, four-day weekends in, in the US, and we found this was for Labor Day. So we mined this over a nine-month period. And first thing we found is that 45 days before anybody had even planned to put up an ad, people were already talking about Labor Day. And we could see that in social media. We could also see that most of the discussions took place, so we could use uh, day parting, which the, the, I think the guys after me will talk about, um, we were able to heavy up our ads on the weekend. The other thing we found is what people were talking about. And, and for Labor Day, I don't know if you remember, there was a lot of news about how expensive the flights were going to be. 
So we saw very quickly that people were looking for alternatives, car rentals. And from a blogger perspective, what they started to do, we noticed that people wanted to know about car accidents. We went into search and we found people wanted to know what was the car accident ratio for, say, San Diego or Las Vegas, because now they were going to drive or they're going to rent a car. If the car accident rate is high, I probably need to buy that silly insurance. So from this, these guys were able to merchandise uh, you know, against car rentals, which they had no plan to do, and do that as well as write articles about whether or not you should or should not get the insurance. Okay, this audience identification, I put this as cutting edge because I haven't seen anybody do this yet. And so what this is, is taking the data. When somebody registers on your site, if you capture the referring URL, the keyword, what keyword did they use and put it against that registration, you can start to see who it is. And, and this is getting into some big brother stuff, but the idea is if somebody comes to your website on a certain term and then they fill out a form, are we marrying that data up? And so what it, we did here was this is for a company doing cloud, uh, cert, cloud computing consulting, and what we found was who is doing this searches? And all we did was is when they came to the web page and filled out for white paper, whatever, we added that keyword to that profile. And by adding that keyword to that profile, we, could, we built a table like here on the right. So it was unknown. So 33%, we didn't know who they were because they didn't give us a role. But the first thing we found out, which was counter to what the company thought, that it was consultants that were looking for this information, which means now there's a third party involved. It wasn't one of you looking for you know, Amazon's cloud computing solution, but it's somebody probably helping you. And so we have to message to those people differently. And as we see, the, as the words change, so does the audience. We had never any way to ever figure out who we were talking to. And think about it. Now you know who you're talking to by simply marrying the query data to any kind of lead gen form that they filled out. And we can start to build some audience personas. And I think this is where things are going to start to drive, because not only are we looking at lifetime value, but audiences. If we know this audience is a decision maker, in this case, a consultant is rarely a decision maker. They're an influencer. So what are the words that a CIO or a CTO or a business traveler versus a recreational traveler is going to use? Um, and that's an example of this we looked at, just asking people, what kind of traveler? Are you an affluent traveler? Are you a regular traveler, a business traveler? And we can start merchandising uh, content against them. Integrating paid and organic, just really quickly. Um, just a couple things, you know, just asking the questions. When you have paid and organic simultaneously, do we know what's happening? Are they comp complementing each other? Now, I think it was Yahoo about eight years ago came out and said, you have a 60% lift in clicks on one or the other if you have both. And I think that's still relatively true. Our friends at Google just came out with this study recently that said it's an 89% lift. What Google failed to tell us is that these were also words where nobody was ranking. So of course, you're gonna, you turn off paid and your traffic goes down. And you turn on paid, especially for words that you don't rank for, your traffic goes up. You know, they even have a cool little video. It's like a duh factor video that shows you how simple, simple this is. But read the fine print. It says this only happens when paid and organic are not ranking together and they're not relevant. Meaning, if you have one, two, or three in paid, one, two, and three in organic, and they're similar in message, people will click the paid. Now imagine that if you knew that combination, you could actually do less paid and get more of that traffic from organic. All I say is test it, no matter which side you stand on. Here's two examples. Here's an example of a word where they're, loot, they're making 6.2 million a month in organic. That's not too bad. But they're losing almost 12,000 a month in paid. Who can justify that? I mean, why would you be buying that phrase? Then the other one is we can show that, it, that they are collaborating. You know, we're spending 2,000 to bring traffic that generates um, you know, three, uh, 200 and some thousand dollars. Duh, we're going to do that. But at least now we know and we can make a decision. Here's another example. So here, paid and organic drove almost the same amount of traffic. Now, if we look at the organic, half of the words where we're spending the most money, we're not ranking for. So all we're saying is whether you agree or disagree with the cannibalization or cooperation, the fact is we're not ranking, so we can't even make the argument. So how about taking the words you're spending the most per click on, like maybe this here, treatment for arthritis, $5.30 a click. Every time someone clicks on something organic, 
you save five dollars. Who cares if they click on both? The point is that for every organic click you get, and you can only get those if you're ranking well. And so that's the thing I, I want us to look at. There's one company that fixed a, a snippet for a number two ranking word that saved them $24,000 a month in clicks. The snippet was gibberish. Google pulls in, tries to create the snippet dynamically. All they did was fix that, get rid of the navigation, have actually something someone would want to click, uh, and save $24,000 a month in PPC costs for that one word only. So it is something that we should definitely take a look at. Then ask the question, is this here for Dell? This is their branded server. Is having these here, two organic and one paid, are they cannibalizing or are they collaborating? Look at the data, see if it's actually helping or hurting. Sort the data by your highest cost per click. Here was a company that were paying anywhere from eight to $12 a click and said, why the hell are we paying that much? The red column means that they aren't ranking for those words. Let's at least figure out how we can rank for words where we're willing to spend the most. These are the 20 most expensive words that we've said we're willing to pay this much every time someone clicks and there's no organic corresponding organic rank. Well, this is simple, either A, you shouldn't be paying that much for those words, or B, let's, let's get our SEO team or somebody to try to fix these. So in wrapping up, sort of the key steps to successful modeling are, you know, understand the intent of the query, and I don't think we take enough time to do that. Understand the real performance. I mean, what is really happening? The paid and organic example. I've not seen uh, really anyone ever compare, are they cannibalizing each other? Are they complementing each other? Understand the context of keywords. What, what is it about this word? What do they want? What do they want to see? Um, and classify words in logical segments. So just simply putting them into buckets. Are they about this? Cheap you know, versus non-cheap or branded versus non-branded. Any of those type of things yield all kinds of great information. And lastly, do anything other than just collecting the data and the words in Excel. Anything beyond that will start to yield opportunities. So thank you. Good time for questions. Okay. So I think we have about five or six minutes for questions. So I know it was a lot of information very quickly. Anybody have any questions? I think if you can come to the mic, it's what they... Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, I guess an, a good example would be with that SAT test prep. So if 70% of the searches um, aren't with the right like qualifying keywords, are you just um, phrase matching things related to SAT prep, or do you get a very long list of um, negative matches? I think it's both. So if you don't have content, why would you pay for the click? And I think the next session is going to talk about things like um, you know, quality score, because if people are clicking and they're immediately hitting the back button, like people coming for, you know, test location or test hours, and you have no content, they hit the back button and that counts negatively against you. So clearly you could negative out hours. Um, you could either, or you could figure out a way to do that. Do you have a site that actually has the hours and move people forward? In that particular case, these, this site or these series of sites weren't doing any of that. They were buying the words, they weren't negating them, they weren't phrasing them. Um, and they didn't have content to match. So people were coming and hitting the back button, so they were losing a lot of opportunities to connect in the very context of what people wanted. Yep. It's hard for me to see, so just say if you're at a mic. Okay. Hello, uh, you mentioned uh, how you do all the research and analyze it, uh, all the keywords and stuff. Do you have any favorite websites or that have a tools or best websites to use besides using uh, but for mining words, the obvious ones, you know, Word Tracker, Trillion, um, WordStream, those give you the data, and obviously Google can do it for free. Um, there are some international tools. I think Andy Atkins is here. He's talking, I think, tomorrow. He, he's got some international tools you could potentially use. Um, I, I'm actually building this kind of tool right now because it doesn't really exist. But Excel and pivot tables. So get an intern from a college. Um, or somebody that knows uh, pivot tables, and that's an amazing way to crunch this data. Or use freelancer.com to find somebody to write you some, some, some small databases to mine it. But I think that's the problem. Very, you know, one large travel site might generate a terabyte of data over two or three months. It's a lot of data to handle, but mining it is, is huge. But those, I'd start there to gather words. Also pull in words from your analytics tool, your paid search. Uh, especially if you've got a portfolio of domains and then um, mine it from there. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, two, two quick ones. Um, I, 
when you were talking about the last slides with the cannibalization of uh, being number one in the mm -hmm. result and, and whether or not you should bid, the, the data you know that you showed on the next slide showed that there was no organic ranking. So I was wondering, you know, what what is that? You know, if you are number one for your key phrase, should you also bid on it, or is it cannibalistic and ends up being uh, negative ROI? No, I would say do it and test the data and look at it over a period of time. So if if all of the and, and the right way to do it is maybe a thousand impressions in paid and simply look to see if I turn it off, if I day part it or pause it, that those thousand impressions, did they come through organic? And, and that's what we were trying to show in that Excel worksheet is that you know, when, you know, when we turn it off, most of them actually do go to organic um, and it saves us from having to pay. Now the thing you have to watch is when you lose that organic ranking or your snippet change, you have to be able to turn that paid back on. Right. So you, you just can't set and leave it. But, but it, it varies. I mean, some cases, paid actually increases because you have a relevant organic. And that's the one where you do want to spend more money on that word because you know it's converting. And which uh, software were you showing when um, you were doing the uh, airfare and the, uh, the budget airfares? And you were showing oh, that was, that was mine. Um, but you can actually do that in a database just by going, like in Excel with a pivot table, you can just you know, build that to say all words that are equal to this category. Um, and then I just pulled in data from, uh, say, Google Analytics or Omniture and just mashed it up in a table. Got it. Thanks. Great yep. presentation. I have one more question. Yep. OK. Looking for color on, on two, two issues. First, what percentage of the data that you're pulling in or showing us here is for people who are paying for an exact click? I mean, I know in, like in Google PPC, you can say, I only want to buy this exact keyword right. versus you can put a keyword in and Google will broadly match that keyword. And so for me, with doing, I mean, I buy traffic, traffic, et cetera, I'm trying to differentiate between buying a broad keyword match versus mm -hmm. buying an exact match. And then the second question that I'm looking for color on is how critical is it per keyword to have keyword landing pages as opposed to, I mean, you didn't really tell me enough to tell me for the keywords I'm buying, do I have an exact keyword landing mm -hmm. page or am I just directing them to my general site? Right, Thank okay, you. two great questions. So one is the, the match type. So um, if you do your data right, you know, many people actually run all, well now all four match types. So they're running exact phrase and broad and, and, or some variation of modified broad match. And, and look at the data because it is night and day. Organic, we can really only get exact match um, there is no, no match type for phrase, I mean, for phrase or, or broad. Um, so exact is especially where it's apples to apples. So when you sort by exact, that's the one where you want to spend most of your time. Then you can start to make some guesses around you know, broad, I mean, uh, like phrase. In phrase match, you can start to see you know, what variations. If you go into Google, it shows you all the variations people use, and you can adjust accordingly. Was this data that we looked at? Exclusively Most, exact match? Yes, the one chart was exact match. Okay, thank you. And then the second part of the question is, I think for any word that you deem as like a tier one or important, you should have an exact landing page. Look at the data. The average person takes, uh, what, three to five seconds to choose something to click in the search results and less than eight seconds to make a decision on a page. So again, the same analogy. If I'm using broad match, and this is the thing, if I buy the phrase digital cameras, and my ad comes up or my organic listing comes up um, and someone, my broad match shows when they did Canon S60 digital camera. I wanted a specific camera. Your broad match was set on digital cameras and your ad said the largest selection of digital cameras. I told you I wanted a camera, so if that's the case, I should come to that camera page. Um, and so we can do that often with organic search because we should have relevance. And so, but as you start to move away from a, an important topic, you can lose the need to have it. Because first thing you're gonna say is we can't scale that. I, I have 90 million keywords and I can't create a page. Well, focus on the ones that are gonna make you money. Prime example, one star hotels in Los Angeles versus five star hotels. Which is gonna make you more money? Five star, obviously. Um, so focus on those. So I think we're probably out of time. So I'll be around all day and in the back of the room. So. I, I see some people jittering that they've got some questions. Uh, so just let me know and we'll have a one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you very much and hopefully it was helpful. Thanks, Bill. That was uh, wonderful. A lot of information there. I'm sure we could uh, have you up here for another half hour. Unfortunately, it is coffee break time. So 
Uh, please grab a beverage and relax and then uh, come back at 11 o'clock. We'll kick off a panel on advanced PPC best practices. So see you in about a half hour. Thank you. Some dust on the clay. What? What could you say as the